Well, hello everybody. Michael J. Burns here, the Reverend from Tulsa, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, coming to you here today on this Friday, December the 9th, 2022. And you know, these past uh, days have been very special days in my memory uh, because back in 1977, 78, I think it was in 79 as well. Uh, Long Island, New York, where I'm from originally, had a great and mighty outpouring of the Spirit through a very wonderful man and his wife and his ministry team, Reverend and my pastor, Reverend Eugene Profeta, uh, in the Mass Speaker Tabernacle. And so, many of you are watching today, uh, I just want you to know that we can remember what happened back all those years ago. How many years would that be now? My goodness, be uh, 42 and 3, about 45 years ago, uh, this outpouring of the Spirit took place. <coughs> I'll never forget at the first meeting at the Coliseum in Long Island, New York, that my mom's parents, or my, my grandparents, Harry and Thelma Brand, both walked the altar among 6,000 people and gave their hearts and their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and served them for the rest remainder of the years, which were several. And uh, they had a wonderful, wonderful God experience in their lives, praise God. And so this is a special day, December the 9th. And we're gonna be teaching tonight's Friday. And I know we're close to Christmas, but Fridays we dedicate to stewardship of our finances. And we're talking about Stewardship Friday. And tonight I plan to conclude this teaching, and it's really an exhortation on the two purposes of poverty. And so I want you to get ready to receive what we are going to be sharing with you today. You know, this is the end of the week, and we are in our seventh year now teaching God's healing word. Monday through Thursday, we teach on the subject of divine healing. But on Fridays, we teach now for the last few years on stewardship, financial stewardship principles that are found in the Word of God. And now, because we're doing this teaching uh, every week uh, for the last number of years, we're asking people to partner with us. You know, we've really proven ourselves. My wife and I pastored for 35 years in Long Island, New York, a church I, I founded there many years ago. Uh, almost four decades ago, actually. And uh, we are now doing this new ministry. Uh, it's an itinerant book writing, social media ministry. And uh, we're coming to you every day, Monday through Friday, uh, with these teachings we're doing, exhorting people, encouraging people, strengthening people with the living word of God. And so I'm asking my friends today, would you join me? Maybe you'd want to be... Uh, be one of our prayer partners who will pray for us. And also, a prayer partner doesn't just say prayers, but they give financially to support our ministry. Now, we're not putting anybody under any pressure right now, but if you'd be inclined to want to help us by the Spirit of God prompting you, then go to our website, mjbministries.org forward slash giving. Now, if you want to just text MJBMIN uh, to uh, 45777, then I'll take you to the same page on our website, and there'll be a drop-down menu that you have to click on and select where you want your offerings to go, to our general fund, uh, to missions, uh, to uh, 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 our book projects, and also partnership. Now, you may say, I want to be a partner, and we explain what partnership is there, you give every month as the Lord directs you to do. No specific amount we ask for. And if you'd be willing to be a partner, commit to a year and see how things go for you in that year's time. We have some partners that have been with us now for several years, and we rejoice in the Lord for that. But we need more. And I've asked God to give me 50 new partners for 2022, and we're just a little shy about 40 or 45 <laughs> partners. But uh, I, I'm sure that some of you are going to hear the voice of the Lord in these remaining weeks of 2022. And I appreciate your support uh, and your giving in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Let's have a word of prayer uh, before we get into the teaching on the two purposes of poverty. This is our final message. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each and every person who's tuned in tonight. And I pray for them, Father God, that as we're going to delve into the two purposes of poverty and cover the second purpose of it, that people's ears will be open, their minds will be receptive, and their hearts also will be receptive. The ears will listen, and you'll think through my mind and speak through my lips to these, your people. And Father, I thank you so very much for the opportunity to share the living word of God, that Lord shackles, I believe, will be broken off of people who have been in, caught up in this spirit of, of poverty, which is really part of the spirit of Antichrist, trying to uh, make things different in this life, not just for them personally, but for our nation and for the nations of the world. Lord, your plan for us is that we might prosper and be in health, even as our soul prospers. And we know that Jesus the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 9, by the grace of God, he became poor so that we, through his poverty, might be made rich. And that means to have a full supply, Father God. And that way the enemy can't do what he wants to do in the world because people of God who are spiritually blessed, emotionally blessed, physically blessed, and financially blessed will be able to put a stop to the words he's trying to do in the earth today. And so, Father, for everything that will be said, done, revealed, or manifested in this broadcast tonight, I'm asking you, and or I'm actually saying to you that I'm in covenant with you to give you and you alone all the glory, the honor, the praise, and the thanks for everything in Jesus' name. Lord, we give you glory now in advance. Amen and amen. Well, I hope you uh, are with me right now, and you're going to join with me uh, in this great teaching we're going to do tonight, and we're going to get into that in the name of Jesus. Let me just turn off that music, and um, let me say some things to you at the beginning. We've been talking about the two purposes of poverty, and one of the first purposes we talked about uh, really uh, lies right here uh, in this simple uh, passage of uh, the statement right here that the first purpose of poverty is to steal your authority to choose in life. You realize today that your choices are decided for you. And let's just talk about some of the practical uh, choices here uh, that we were talking about. Uh, we're talking about uh, the choices of uh, where you're going to live, uh, what you're going to uh, eat, what you're going to wear, what kind of car you're going to drive. Come on, somebody. And this is really determined by poverty. Poverty makes these decisions for you. Can I get any men from somebody? And I want you to understand something here too, my friend, that when you have lost your authority to choose in life, you then begin to battle some things in life that God really hasn't planned on you battling. And I'm going to tell you what some of those things are. Some of those things happen to be shame. Someone say shame. Now, we talked about this last Friday about shame and how many people, because of their lack, because of their inability to pay the bills on time, because of their inability to give to the gospel, because poverty takes your power away and makes a decision for you what you can give or not give. And as a result of that, my friend, you're missing out on what God has planned for you because you are living under the influence of what I refer to as the spirit of poverty. And we actually define poverty here. And I'm going to just give you the, uh, the, the definition for poverty here. Can I do that? Let me just turn it off real quick. Uh, the, the definition we gave for poverty is found, uh, it says here, uh, the state of being extremely poor. Come on, somebody. The state of being inferior in quality or insufficient in amount 
I'm talking about money here, the re, uh, the renunciation of the right for, uh, to individual ownership of property as even part of a religious vow. We may uh, mention here that Merriam-Webster uh, actually defines it and says that uh, in similar definition uh, that it is a little differently spoken of here as the state of one who lacks, call on somebody, that's one of the meaning of the word poverty, those who lack a, a usual or socially acceptable amount of money or material possessions. And it uses these two terms, we said, of scarcity and dearth. And this is certainly not the place that God intends for you uh, to live. Now, we've been also giving you this great quote here from Pastor Jim Baker from Zion Christian Fellowship uh, in Ohio. This is a, another man by the name of Jim Baker, and it's a common name, but this is not who some think it might be. This is a different man. And he said prosperity, and I love his definition. He says it's where you have no financial debt. Come on, somebody. Where you have more than enough finances to fulfill every assignment that God has for you and enough left over to help others fulfill theirs. And so this is really the intention of why God wants you to be blessed, why Jesus became poor, not just with our sin. He didn't just carry our sicknesses. Thank God he did. But he also wanted to do something and that was he became poor, you know, and that he that we can be rich. You know, we're going to talk when we get done next Friday. I believe I'm going to start this, and I'm going to answer the question from the Bible, uh, was Jesus poor? And we're going to get into that for the next several Fridays next Friday. And I'm very excited about getting into that because I can tell you that Jesus even said that he wasn't one of the poor. And I'm going to show you that scripture when we come together next Friday. But I want to get into some of this uh, teaching here and share with you what the Word of God actually says here. And this is the second purpose of poverty. And this is, I believe, speaking about uh, the Antichrist. You could say the spirit of Antichrist, or you could even speak about the actual being who will be the Antichrist, and we don't know who that is as of yet. People have their guesses, but uh, this is speaking about him. And Daniel, who was a prophet of God, who was a, had many visitations by angels, God spoke to him very specifically about the last days, and he said that this one who rises up as the Antichrist, he will speak great words, against the most high. Well, that's just what the devil would want to do. And that person who is the Antichrist is under the influence of Satan himself, and he'll speak great words against the most high. Now, we know that happens even today. He's still speaking negatively about who God is and, and saying bad things to us about God. He's a liar and the father of lies, John 8, 44 tells us. And the Bible says, though, with his great words, it'll speak against the Most High uh, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. You see, Satan's objective is to get us to a place of inactivity where we'll be so discouraged, where we'll be so de despondent and depressed about maybe our circumstances. I mean, people have looked in the last two years and have seen in our country, in America, that there's been a lot of uh, disapproval about those who are in leadership in our federal government, our president. We pray for him, of course, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of issues with him and a lot of things in the economy that are happening that haven't been good. The price of gas has gone up. It's starting to come down a little bit now, but even our oil reserves uh, that we've had stored up in Alaska uh, is now depleted. I mean, there's so many things. The price of food and groceries has gone up. I just spent today about $50 in groceries, and I can't believe how few things I actually got. And I shopped at Walmart earlier. And so what I'm actually saying is that 
we're seeing a lot of stuff happening uh, in the world. And, and people are beginning to be worn out. And so he shall speak, this Antichrist spirit and this person will speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And listen to this next statement. This is the second purpose of poverty. And think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of times. Now, I'm going to make a few comments about this here, and I want you to hear clearly what we are going to say here. God is the one who has established times and seasons, and God has established laws. I can just show you a couple of scriptures, one of which uh, is in Daniel, the second chapter, and verse 20 and 21. And this is what it actually says here. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever, come on somebody, and, and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. And <clears throat> what we're saying here is that God has some control in what he does. He has power that he unleashes or releases to people with certain gifts, anointings, and he gives them in specific areas. It's not just for the pulpit and preaching. It's for people in business. It's for people in government. It's for people in the arts and the media. It's people uh, in, in healthcare. It's people who work in the legal profession. It's for people that God gives these abilities to in all these areas. Now, not everybody who works in those areas is yielding to God and doing things God's way. And so they are under that wrong spirit. I call it the spirit of poverty, which is the spirit of Antichrist, which is trying to change times, seasons, and as Daniel 7.25 said, and even laws. Now, you can look with me, if you will, over in Acts, the first chapter, and it says here, uh, therefore, this is after Jesus was raised from the dead. He's now appeared 40 days or uh, 40 days after uh, his resurrection uh, to about, well, we, we don't know exactly how many, but it's above 500 people, Paul tells us in, a letter, in his letter uh, to the Corinthians later on. Therefore, when they had come together, these are the above 500 people, they asked Jesus, who is now resurrected from the dead, Lord, will you at this time return the kingdom to Israel? See, people were misunderstanding why Jesus had come. Israel was living under Roman oppression, and they were, had been uh, occupied by the Romans, and they were subjected to Roman laws, and many of them wanted to just be under God's laws, the, the Mosaic law. But at the same time, what happened here was they thought when Messiah came, in fact, they, they were acknowledging that it was, they thought when Messiah came that he would change the government, that he would change, you know, their political economic situation there in Israel. And so, they're asking, Lord, will you at this time, at this season, will you restore the kingdom of Israel? Will you take it from the Romans and give it back to us to be in charge of our country? Well, Jesus said to them in verse number seven, he said, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own authority or power. And so we can see here that God has a plan. God has a design for the world and for nations of the world. He has a plan for Israel. I believe he has a plan for the United States. And I believe he has a plan for every country uh, that exists here on the planet. But here's the thing, that we have to be focused on what God is saying for us in this day and this hour. Now, I don't have it here, but if you were to go to verse number eight, you would see in verse number eight, Jesus said, but you shall receive power 
after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And so we can see here that God's plan is not just a natural political plan, but it's a spiritual plan that will affect natural economic and political uh, you know, arenas like that. And so it will affect every area arena or arena of life. And so this is why uh, we have to be really sensitive to what God is saying uh, to us. Why do I say that? Well, look at Hebrews chapter 1 and verse uh, number 1 and 2. It says here, and I love this, in Hebrews 1 and verses 1 and 2, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past, now, this is talking again about times, seasons, and uh, he spoke to the fathers by the prophets. So God spoke in the Old Testament through the prophets. Now, there were times God did speak to individuals, but mostly he spoke to the prophet, the priest, or the king. And many times the kings, God spoke to them in dreams. Uh, but we see here that God spoke at various times and in various ways. And he did this in different times that have gone by. And he did it to those Old Testament patriarchs, fathers of, of the Old Testament by the prophets. But notice verse 2. He has in his last days spoken to us, this is the church, Christians today, by his son, whom we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. And so we can see clearly here that God did what he did, and he spoke at various times. Now, in the New Testament Greek language, there's a word that we find called kairos. And you've heard of that term in the Greek, uh, kairos moment. This is an appointed time for God's plan to be enacted, to be put forth, to, to be uh, started. And so we see these Kairos moments. But let me just draw your attention to some things that maybe you don't understand. See, the, the Old Testament was in he, uh, translated out of Hebrew. The New Testament was translated, they say, from Aramaic into Greek and into other languages, which we have in our Eng English language. But listen to these. The word time is also in the New Testament a word that speaks of dispensations. Now, dispensations are time periods. And these are things that God has done in days gone by uh, in different times. Now, let me give you, we're living right now, since the time of Adam, we're living in the sixth. That's the sixth dispensation. Let me show you what that is right here, and I think you'll appreciate it. The first dispensation of time was right after God had created the heavens and the earth, and he created the Garden of Eden, and he put Adam in there, and eventually Eve along with him. <clears throat> this is known as the dispensation or the time period of innocence. And again, when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, and this was before the fall. The second dispensation happened after the fall, and it went up until the time of the flood of Noah. This is where we lived in what has been called the dispensation of conscience. Now, people live no longer out of that, out of their spirit to spirit relationship with God, but they live by conscience, and their consciences have become corrupted by sin. <clears throat> so God eventually said, I'm going to destroy the earth, and he had Noah build an ark. And him and his family were the survivors, and God literally started over again. Now, the third dispensation we know is the dispensation of human government. Now, this happened after Noah, and it lasted until the time of the Tower of Babel, where God took, where the people were of one language, and God divided their languages, 
and people begin to settle in other parts of the earth, and nations began at that point. That was human government, the dispensation of human government. Well, then came the time of promise, the dispensation of promise. This happened after uh, God made a covenant with himself, because a covenant is only as strong as its weakest link, and he made it with Abraham, and he allowed Abraham to get in on this covenant. Now, let me just take you to the next, uh, the fifth one we know is the dispensation of the law, and God gave this law, that not just the Ten Commandments, there were some like 666 laws that God gave through Moses, and it lasted so this dispensation of law lasted until Jesus died on the cross. Now, this is significant. And uh, I think if you look at Exodus 19 and verse number 8, you can see there that the Israelites said to God, they wanted, they wanted to keep God's law. But, you know, God didn't want them to keep the law. He wanted to treat them by grace like we're being treated now under the New, under the New Testament but Israel wanted God's laws. They said, we can do it. We can do it. And God said, you can't do it. I know you can't. You need my grace right now. And they didn't want grace. They wanted the law. And so God gave them what they wanted, the law. And as a result of that, Israel uh, fell into a, this dispensation of law where they could not keep it. And God began to hold the sins of the people accountable to God. God did. He held them accountable for their sins and judged them according to their performance. But here's what we see, though, that when that law, when that dispensation of law ended at the time Christ was crucified, we entered into what we're living in right now for over 2,000 years. It's the dispensation of grace or the church age. And it began on the day of Pentecost, not just when Jesus was raised from the dead, but when the Holy Spirit descended in that upper room. And that's the day you and I are living in right now. And that's going to last that dispensation of uh, the church age or grace. The dispensation of grace is going to last until the rapture of the church. And that can happen at any time. And friends, thank God, this is where you and I are living right at this moment, praise God. And so we are living in a very, very special time period uh, of, of that. Now let me take you real back, back real quick here to Daniel 7.25. The first, has been, the first purpose of poverty, we said, was that poverty steals your authority over your life, your ability to choose where you're going to live, what you, what kind of, you know, what kind of house you live in, what kind of food you're going to be able to eat, what kind of schools you can send your children to, how much money you can give to the for the gospel and the preaching of the word around the world in your local church and in your community, how you can help people. Uh, poverty makes those decisions for you. But then in Daniel seven twenty five again, Satan is going to speak great words against God Most High, and he'll wear out the saints of the of the Most High God, by his words that he'll speak. And his his objective is found, it says, and he'll think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until the time and times and the dividing of time. So we're seeing what's happening, what Daniel saw, we're seeing that happen today. You know, who would ever thought, even just 50 or maybe 100 years ago, that America itself and our nation would become so corrupted. We'd see legalization of, of abortion. We would see gay marriage being legalized. We would see transgenderism uh, being uh, taught by these transgender people, just students who are in kindergarten in the first grade and early elementary school years. We're seeing laws being passed right now uh, in our nation. Right now, doctors uh, are performing surgeries, changing the sex by surgeries of children, uh, and they can do it without the consent of the parents 
or they try to manipulate the parents by saying, well, either you let your child have this surgery or they'll commit suicide when they get a little older. We are living in a time where Satan is doing the work he's doing. See, people that are part of the uh, critical race theory, people that are part of a woke generation, that are saying the things that they're saying right now, my friend, this is a demon spirit, a demonic spirit from hell that is ruling in their lives. And through that, Satan is trying to change the time we're living, which he's been doing, and laws of our land, and the Bible says that righteousness will exalt a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. You know, I've run out of time today to share what I wanted to wanted to share, but I hope you got the idea that poverty is is disempowering, and prosperity is empowering to you. Because if you have the money, you're going to be able to influence things in life with the resources that you have that God will lead you to do. But when you don't have any money, you don't have any influence. Someone said that uh, the golden rule is he who has the gold rules. Well, I don't think that's really the biblical definition of the golden rule, but it does have an element of truth to it uh, about God wanting uh, to do certain things uh, in the lives of people today. Now, let me uh, just share with you as we close today that poverty is something and lack is something that you should resist. You ought not to allow it to tell you to stop giving to your church. You ought to tell them that you're not gonna you're not gonna stop helping other people as the Lord impresses you to do, even when it seems like you can't afford to do something, you're still gonna do it. Because you're going to operate in a spiritual law known as the spiritual law of reciprocity, also known as the law of sowing and reaping. Based in Genesis 8.22, the Bible said, as the earth remains, there'll be seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, you know, day and night. All that will exist. And we're living in it naturally, but we're also living in it spiritually. Galatians 6, 7 in the Phillips translation says, a man's harvest depends entirely upon what he sows. And so, sow it to your church. Sow it to ministries that strengthen you. Give to them. Pray for them. And say, devil, I'm not going to give into the spirit of poverty and lack. I'm not going to allow you to change, take my authority on where I'm going to live, what I'm going to give, what my, where my children are going to go to school, what kind of food we're going to eat, what kind of car we're going to drive. I'm not going to let you limit me, and I'm not going to let you change times and laws in the land through the debauchery of other people who are putting the money in support of these things. In Jesus' name, that's not what I'm going to do. Let me just say, today, we need you to rise up. Would you rise up today? Would you be a partner with us at MJB Ministries. We're asking you to visit our website, mjbministries.org forward slash giving, or you can text MJBMIN to 45777, and that will take you to the same page on our website, and you can give there. At the drop down, choose the account or journal fund, become a partner, give to missions, give to our book projects, and we are wanting to do a lot in the coming year of 2023. And we cannot do it without people like you helping us. Amen. You can also give through the Cash App. If you have that, you can get the Cash App for free. And you can find us at dollar sign MJB Ministries. Thank you for being with us today and all this week. We're so very thankful that you've joined us. Go to church on Sunday, support your local church and your pastors, and I'll see you Monday when God says the word. We're still talking about the true nature of God. God bless you today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.